Welcome to God is Open. I'm your host, Christopher Fisher. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about the fundamentals, the basic idea, what is dispensationalism? Just an introduction to the term, the concept, and what it means. I started a thread once, I don't know where it was, where I said, if you're not eating kosher law, you are dispensationalist. If you believe God changed his kosher law standards that we don't have to eat kosher law anymore, that once we did, and now we don't, you in fact are a dispensationalist. And some guy in the thread was taking issue with me. He thought I was smuggling in concepts. He, I, he, I was trying to trick people into becoming dispensationalists. That uh, once they said, oh yeah, I guess I'm a dispensationalist, then I'd hit them with a one-two sucker punch and say, ha ha, now you believe in the rapture. Now you believe in a millennial reign. Now you believe in blood moons. And so he said, that's not what dispensationalism is. Dispensationalism is all about blood moons and raptures and millennial reigns. Well, well, I have to hand it to you. Um, that That's very creative and all. But I'm a dispensationalist and I'm a, an amillennialist. I, I don't think this millennial reign, I think that's more um, more of a metaphorical language. It's It's more of an abstract concept of what could be rather than this thing will definitely happen. And I don't believe that the rapture will happen, that this one little phrase that Paul uses is a good evidence that there's going to be some sort of everyone teleports to heaven instead of what N.T. Wright, his take on it is, that it's it's just mixing metaphors, that he's using this language about this coming of the Son of God to earth, that we'll meet him in the heaven, and then it's a direct to earth, and then the establishment of the kingdom. It's mixing metaphors, as N.T. Wright writes. But, anyway, so dispensationalism, I'd like to disassociate from uh, the Hagees of the world, the people who are known for blood moon theories, or millennial reigns, or all the, this craziness that often gets associated with dispensationalism. Dispensationalism, at its core, is the idea that God deals with different individuals differently, different people groups at different points of times and different places. He deals differently. God can change his methods of interacting, his standards for interaction, the rules for interaction, the rules for what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a God-fearer, a Yahweh worshiper. These things can change based on person, place, time, even within people. God could get, deal differently with different people at different points of time. God is a person, and God can change. Fundamentally, dispensationalism is linked to open theism. God can change his methods. So I'd like to start out this whole uh, dispensationalism episode with a clip from the most famous dispensationalist to ever exist, David Koresh. David, take it away. The first thing that I would like to introduce in our subject is the reasons for the revelation of Jesus Christ. No, that was all a joke. So David Koresh, I don't think he's a dispensationalist or anything. But anyways, uh, dispensationalist, we, we often have these dispensational charts. So I'll go ahead and pull one of those up for the record so that everyone can see that. And here we got... A dispensationalist chart. Oh no, I was just making that up too. So it's uh, kind of this is the integrated defense acquisition technology and logistics lifecycle management framework, the DoD's guide to lifecycle procurement management in their system. The most complicated government chart they say is in existence. Let's see how that compares to dispensationalist charts. There's a dispensationalist chart. Not much better, not much better. So a lot of times you'll come across these uh, dispensationalist images online and they'll be confusing and they'll be just like our logistical defense integrated acquisition of technology chart, just absolutely insane. So we could probably just go ahead and discard that all because fundamentally dispensationalism is not about confusing crazy graphs. All right, I have pulled up Ephesians 3, and Ephesians 3 is going to kind of give us an introduction to uh, just the basic term dispensationalism, what it means. And this is Paul writing. He writes this, 
For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. I have the New King James uh, pulled up, but I, I might be kind of reading in my head uh, the New American Standard because back in the day when I had all of Ephesians memorized, that's what I used as the New American Standard. So a lot of these these terms, they, they flag to me in uh, New American Standard. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other age was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the spirits to his holy apostles and prophets. And then, and then he goes on to say this, a new American standard says to be specific that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. This is the key to what Paul says is his dispensation. He says it's the mystery and he says it's not been made known before. So dispensation is a word, Ephesians 3, 2. Let's go pull up the Greek, the Greek word for that. Oikonomia. This sounds like sounds like maybe an English word we got. Uh, economy. Oikonomia. House rule, right? So the rules of the house, the rules about how things are done. Just think of the word itself. Dispensation. Uh, dispensary. Think about what that is. If you're an English person, that's where they distribute medicine. They they hand out medicine. My, my mom's a pharmacist actually. So our big joke was when my dad was laid off for some time that uh, my mom supported the family by selling drugs. So good times. But she worked in a dispensary where she dispensed, she divvied out drugs. So house rule, oikonomia. It's the economy, right? It's all about the economy, how things are run. And so Paul's describing something that's very interesting here. He's describing something that's new, which in other ages have not been revealed to the, the people who follow God, right? He says, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to the spirit of his holy apostles and prophets. This is something new that's going on. This is something not known before. It's called the mystery, and he's adopting mystery cult language and the mystery cults in those times were were cults that were centered around a particular god and they had mysteries inside their cult and those mysteries were revealed only to the elect or or the secret members the highest tier members of those mystery cults and they got the inner workings about how these things worked paul he's subverting this concept he's making it known to all people what that mystery is He's subverting mystery languages and saying this is the Christian mystery and specifically that the Gentiles are fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Think back to Jesus's ministry. When did he tell any Gentile that the Gentiles were equal to the Jews? He didn't. He didn't. He called them dogs. He called them dogs. And then the Gentile woman had to beg for scraps. Even the little dogs get scraps from the table. And then he acquiesced her. He acquiesced her. But otherwise, his preaching was primarily to Israel. What else was his preaching primarily? Primarily, he was a moral teacher. He taught about a moral revolution. He has talked about revival. It's uh, telling people not to sin. Telling people to reform their lives. To get ready for the coming apocalypse was Jesus's ministry. If you look at the times that Jesus tries to talk about himself, they're, they're few and far between. You know, there, there's some private meetings. Most of these instances happen in the book of John. In the book of John, it's not really about his public ministry. It's not about Jesus's public ministry. All these, these side conversations come up that aren't present in other gospels. And it's all, all a secret conversation. Who do you say I am? Oh, we, we say you're the Christ. Okay, don't do not tell anyone. Jesus was commanding his followers to tell no one who he was. Jesus' ministry was not about himself. It might be Bart Ehrman. I couldn't, I couldn't track down the quote. I was looking for the quote. But I think it's in his lectures on the New Testament, on Jesus, that Christianity converted from a religion of Jesus, a religion that Jesus taught, to a religion about Jesus. Uh, specifically highlighting aspects of who Jesus was and what Jesus did for us. 
This was not Jesus' ministry. This is not what Jesus himself was teaching. Jesus taught a moral revolution, a moral reformation. And Paul, Paul taught Jesus. So long story short, dispensationalism is the idea that God deals with different people in different places, in different times, in different fashions. Technically speaking, if you are not eating kosher right now, if you're if you're uh, refraining from bacon or something like that, uh, if you eat kosher, it doesn't apply, but if you are not eating kosher, then you are a dispensationalist of types. You believe that God's laws or God's rules do have a time and place, can be changed, can expire. God deals differently with different people at different points of time. This is in contrast to other views like covenant theology, that every person throughout the Bible was quote-unquote saved in the same manner from time eternal. So you'll deal with people. I, I met one kid, and it was at Summit Ministries in Colorado. This is when I was like 17. And uh, I was talking to him about uh, his covenant theology. He was a covenant theologian. And he said, stated, and, you know, he's like a kid. He's like 17. He's like my age too. But uh, he stated that from time eternal, everyone was saved by faith alone, without works. And, and his evidence that uh, Adam was reached with this gospel was the prophecy of, of the serpent biting the heel and his, the serpent's head being crushed. That was his proof that all people throughout all eternity have been given the same quote-unquote gospel. It's just not true. Jesus did not preach about himself. Jesus taught a moral revolution. So going back to Ephesians 3, the mystery. A mystery is something that's not widely known. Paul often encounters uh, a lot of critics. Wherever he goes, he encounters people who do not like what he's saying. And the funny thing is, his critics are primarily Jewish. The, the Jews are the primary ones to reject Paul's new, interesting message. He, he gets all sorts of pushback that the 12 disciples never get in their ministry. And he's persecuted by the Jews. What is he teaching that is so controversial? Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Remember, in standard Jewish Old Testament theology, uh, the Gentiles had a place. And so the Jews are supposed to be a priest nation. They're supposed to be a light to the world. They're, they're supposed to bring Gentiles and the rest of the world to God. But there was never this equality. There was never this one-on-one, -on -one, you know, a Jew is the same as a Gentile. But Paul introduces something radically new, something radically different. And we might want to turn to Romans to see why exactly he does that. I'm not saying that he's doing it rather than God. But for some reason, there is a change. In Romans 11, 11, we, we find this section that in the New King James, I guess they titled over, overall section, the Gentiles grafted in. So a graft is a change. So something's changing. Paul is describing a change of the state of affairs. He says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them, the Jews, to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Right there, that should tell you the basic tenet of open theism, that there are changes, that God changes. God changes who he's reaching and what way he's reaching them at different points of time for different purposes. Dispensationalism goes hand in hand with open theism. God changes how God operates. It's the dispensation. It's the economy. So there is a change, a change being described. I, I, I can't Personally, I can't contemplate those individuals who say there, there's not a change, that everything's going on the same as always, that Paul is teaching the exact same thing that Jesus taught, that uh, the Old Testament taught. I just don't see it. There is a change. Gentiles are being grafted in. Grafted in is a change. And it's for a reason. The reason is to make the Jews jealous. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, see, the Gentiles are benefiting somehow. There's some sort of change that benefits the Gentiles. How much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles in so much as I am an apostle of the Gentiles. So Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles. What was Paul's ministry? Paul talks about circumcision more than anyone else within the Bible. 
it's it's almost entirely throughout all his works circumcision that circumcision this not very many other people talk about circumcision paul's telling the gentiles that they do not have to be circumcised to receive full membership in the body of christ this is revolutionary uh, the jews hate him for it the jews hate paul because Paul is teaching people not to circumcise. And we see that come to a head in Acts 21, where it comes to light that Paul's been teaching Jews, not just Gentiles not to circumcise, Paul's been teaching Jews not to circumcise. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is reconciling the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, and the lump is also holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. And some, if some of the branches are broken off, see, there's changes. There's, there's things that are happening. Different people groups are being grafted in. Different people groups are being pulled off. And you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them and with them, became a partaker of the root of the fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches. So he's saying, you Gentiles who have now been grafted in, you, you guys don't have a place to boast because if you're boasting, you guys aren't natural branches, so think about how you know natural branches are naturally a part of the tree. You're not a natural part of the tree. You could be cut off like that again. So if you misbehave, if if you're if you're doing this thing wrong, you as well can be in the future cut off. It's a warning. Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. This, this is all change. This is all about switching people groups. God's uh, economy, his dispensation, who he's working with at specific points of time in specific manners. Now, dispensationalism, there's a wide berth of dispensationalists. And so we'll pull up our dispensationalist chart again. And uh, we see this person, whoever built this chart, thinks that there's all these different periods in which God deals with various individuals in different manners for different reasons. And uh, it's pretty complicated, but this, this is not the core of dispensationalism. God changing methodology is the core of dispensationalism, not some person's attempt to categorize it all. All of this is just their attempt to systematically build the Bible into a model which may or may not be present. A lot of dispensationalist charts say, oh, uh, God had multiple dispensations with Abraham because he changed how he dealt with Abraham here and then over here. And then they'll put each of those as like an age or, or put it on the chart in some fashion. But remember, God, God is an individual. God is a person. God is personal. He deals with different people groups differently at different points of time he deals with different individuals uh differently at different points of time I, I i think it's a little pedantic to be throwing that on the chart every time god deals with someone in a different manner for for salvation for for considering that person a yahweh worshiper or a christian or someone who is true to the faith god deals with different people differently at different points of time and there's changes there's changes for a reason and paul writes in romans 11 that the latest change the purpose is not for us gentiles uh i'm a gentile but uh, i got grafted in and it wasn't for anything i did it wasn't like oh the gentiles are so great the specific reason given is that by grafting me in uh, maybe the jews are going to get jealous and jealous they are these jews modern day jews they don't like the fact that christians are claiming membership in traditional uh, Jewish body fellowship, we'll say. They, they don't like that fact. It is, in fact, making them jealous. How, how many Jews are converting to Christianity? Ultimately, it might not have had the intended effects. But a reason is given and a change is given. It's a change given for reasons. God is changing in order to accomplish something. Does that thing materialize? Not necessarily. So real quickly, backing up, just fundamentally, what is dispensationalism? The idea that God deals differently with different individuals, with different people groups, in different times and places, in different ways. God could change those ways. God can change 
how he's dealing with people for different purposes. Dealing with people for salvation, for standards of righteousness. Remember, Paul talks about uh, Jesus' death atoning for our sins, which you don't have Jesus' death atoning for our sins in the Old Testament. You're not getting that. you got some sort of animal sacrifice which atones for sins. There's, there's other ways to atone for sins. Isaiah has a coal that cleanses his, his mouth and body, which atones for his sins. There's different ways of atoning for sins throughout the Bible. Right. There's different ways of having fellowship with God. Remember, Israel entered, entered into a covenant relationship with God. They were given a series of priestly laws and priestly dictates that they had to follow. And the foreigners among them did not have to follow these dictates because they weren't part of the covenant people. So they didn't have to do the covenant rituals in order to be part of this covenant group. There's different people groups and God at the same point in time is dealing differently and has different standards uh, based on who you are, where you're at, what your situation is in life. Dispensationalism is the idea that God deals differently with different people at different points of time. Now, there's different types of dispensationalists that we will quickly go over. A lot of times you, you might hear some uh, terms, maybe uh, Acts 2 dispensationalist, someone who thinks that, oh, once Jesus died, then this new dispensation kicks off. Then there's the Acts 9 dispensationalist also known as mad mid acts dispensationalists they believe that a new dispensation started with paul in acts 9 and this is the time that god implemented this grafting in of the gentiles not acts 2 remember in acts 2 everything's focused on oh you know this this whole tr thing was a tragedy jesus's death was a tragedy and they're the 12 and james are still reaching out to the jews there's no thought about outreach to the Gentiles until Paul comes on the scene. Paul is really the change agent that implements this outreach to the Gentiles. And so Acts 9 is identified as this dispensation change. And even within mid-Acts dispensationalism, there's different schools of thought. There's the mid-Acts in where they believe that, you know, Paul had his dispensation to the Gentiles. But the 12 were in on it. And so the 12 and Paul were really proselytizing both Jews and Gentiles wherever they went with the same message. And then there's the Acts 12 out where Paul is teaching something differently, differently than James and the 12. The James and the 12 are teaching Jews symbolic law. They're, they're teaching them Levitical law, priestly law, the covenant theology and Paul is teaching Gentiles that they do not have to follow the law. They do not have to circumcise, but they can still attain full membership in the body of Christ. So there's two different people groups being proselytized, two different messages at the same time. This is the mid-Acts out position where there's, there's two separate things. And even, even further than that, I was in a phone call with other mid-Acts dispensationalists and one of the main guys I uh, so started talking about, you know, of, of course, they're all on the same page that this is right and proper for Paul to do. And I said, yeah, there, there's a lot of tension there, though. So normal scholarship on this issue, the Bart Ehrman and Rita Aslan's of the world, they see tension between Paul and the 12 and James. And this comes to the head. It starts in Acts 15 and comes to a head in Acts 21, in which Paul is called out by James. Paul is teaching Jews not to circumcise. James has given Paul a specific letter to the Gentiles to teach them to be God-fearers and not have to follow all the covenant laws. But Paul goes over and above this in Acts 21, and he's found out that he's been teaching the Jews not to circumcise, which is a violation of their original covenant, which enrages the Christians of uh, in Jerusalem, Christian Jews who are faithful God-fearers, they love the law, they're zealous for the law, is the words used in Acts 21, and they want Paul's head. Paul is turning their ancient laws, their ancient customs, their ancient rites. This is Christianity. He's turning Christianity on its head, telling Gentiles that Gentiles can be full members and not have to circumcise not only that, but Jews as well. Jews do not have to circumcise in Paul's dispensation. This is actually my position. It doesn't have to be your position, but we'll go ahead and read through Acts 21 so that everyone can see what is happening. 
On the following day, Paul went in with us to James. Now, James has taken leadership of the Christian church. James is the figurehead. Although he wasn't one of the twelve, he's the brother of Jesus, and he, he seems to command a lot of respect. His, his letter of James uh, is, is noted by pagan historians. So the figure of James is noted. James is the figurehead of the Christian church. And when he greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. This same thing happens in Acts 15, where this gives legitimacy to what Paul is doing. Paul is building a following of Gentiles, and this, this is glorifying God. And this, it would be a mistake for James to outright alienate Paul because Paul has a following. Very smart move to do, and it shows that God is endorsing Paul's ministry. If he's bearing such fruit, that means God is endorsing. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed. So these are Christians. Uh, this is James talking, and he's telling Paul that a lot of Jews are believing Jews. Then he says, and they are zealous for the law. These are Bible-believing Christians, Christians who follow Jesus, the Messiah, and they're zealous for the law. That means, what does that tell us? James is not teaching the same thing that Paul is teaching. Paul is teaching that we don't have to follow a lot of these sacrificial laws, these Levitical codes. And, and some would say that he's telling them they really don't have to follow any moral law except for sake of conscience. That's why you should. Your salvation is not dependent on it. Faith alone is, is another possibility of his messages, which is going to differ exceedingly from James. James still wants circumcision. James is still zealous for the law. All these Christian Jews have not been taught otherwise. They, they have been around. They've been around for, I don't know, decades, decades after Jesus has died. And uh, they're all zealous for the law still. This is a message that is only going out to Paul's converts, not to James and the Twelve. And we see that we see that in Galatians where Paul is dealing with these Judaizers. These Judaizers are Christians. These are men from James. As we read in Galatians, these are the people who follow James and Peter. This is what they believe. They are zealous for the law. Paul is not zealous for the law. Paul is different. He's teaching something radically different. Verse 21, But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not circumcise their children nor walk according to the customs. Yeah, this is a legitimate complaint. This is, this is something Paul is doing. Paul is teaching Jews that Jews do not have to circumcise. Flashback to Acts 15. Their compromise is that Paul will proselytize the Gentiles and he'll tell the Gentiles that the Gentiles don't have to follow the laws except for certain laws, laws against sexual immorality and laws against the consumption of blood. But this was for the Gentiles, it's not for the Jews. He was not given dispensation, quote unquote, from James, from Peter to proselytize Jews not to follow the law. Paul took that of his own initiative. And of course, Paul, throughout his letters, claims that all his mystery that he's received, all his religion, his dispensation, is straight from God. In Galatians, he sets out his case that he received nothing from the Twelve. He received nothing from James. He received nothing from men considered in high repute. He is establishing his own independent authority, saying that he's not subservient to their views. He doesn't have to follow their views because his authority comes directly from God. He passed James, passed the Twelve, comes straight from God. So they can't put a theological check on his beliefs. That's his argument in Galatians. So absolutely, absolutely, Paul is teaching Jews not to circumcise. And this is a bad thing in James' mind. So James forces him to go through a purification rite to prove that these are things that he is not teaching. What then? The assembly must certainly meet for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. And the assembly is Christians. These are Christians. They're zealous for the law. And they are mad. They're going to kill. They're going to kill Paul over this. Over teaching Jews not to circumcise. That is, yeah, for all intents and purposes, blasphemy in their minds. Therefore, do what we will tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. 
Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things which they were informed concerning you are nothing. So he's doing this right in order to tell everyone, to tell the Jews, to tell the Christian Jews that he is not teaching the Jews not to circumcise. Gentiles, that's, that's fine. That's fine for him to do. That was their agreement in Acts 15. But going above and beyond that and teaching Jews not to circumcise was against their agreement. Huh. So what we understand here is that Paul is not teaching the same things, the same people that James is. Paul is teaching something distinct, something unique, something that draws the error, the, the anger of normal Jewish Christianity. And it's not me alone saying this. This is, this is the scholarly opinion. We're going to start with Rita Aslan in his book Zealot. Regardless, by the year 57 CE, the rumors about Paul's teachings could no longer be ignored. And so, once again, he is summoned to Jerusalem to answer for himself. This time, James confronts Paul directly, telling him that it has come to his attention that Paul has been teaching believers to forsake Moses and not circumcise their children or observe the customs of the law. Acts 21.21 21. Paul does not respond to the accusation. Though this is exactly what he has been teaching, he has even gone so far as to say that those who let themselves be circumcised will have cut themselves off from Christ, Galatians 5, 2 through 4. To clear up matters once and for all, James forces Paul to take part with four other men in a strict purification ritual in the temple, the same temple that Paul believes has been replaced by the blood of Jesus, so that all will know there is nothing to the rumor said about you and that you observe and guard the lot. So the purpose of Paul doing this is so that everyone will understand that he observes and guards the law. Back to Aslan. Paul obeys. It seems he has no other choice in the matter. After the embarrassing spectacle at the temple in which he is forced to renounce everything that he had been preaching for two decades, Paul wanted to get as far away from Jerusalem and the ever-tightening noose of control placed around his neck by James and the apostles. Besides, Rome seemed like a perfect place for Paul. Let's go see what Ehrman says about a lot of these things. From Ehrman's book, Peter, Paul, and Mary Magdalene. So if you read three books of uh, Bart Ehrman, this is one of them, Peter, Paul, and Mary Magdalene. Just read the Peter and Paul part. The Mary Magdalene was thrown in for, you know, just so that he could have some more uh, more buy-in. The Dan Brown books were pretty popular, talking about, oh, Mary's marrying to Jesus or whatever. Skip that part. Not a very important part. But Peter, Paul, and Mary is one of his better books. Jesus, Apocalyptic Prophet of the New Testament is another. And last of all, uh, get his Lost Christianities and read that. So those three books of Bart Ehrman's are his best three that everyone should read. If you, if you read books, if you have time, if you like this sort of thing. But in this book, he says this, As I've intimated, Paul's own writings show that not everyone agreed with this view of the law, including Peter. We will never hear his side of the argument in Antioch. This is in Galatians. Just Paul's. One can only wonder whether Peter readily yielded and agreed that he had been bested. It seems rather unlikely. Certainly the other missionaries who came to Galatia in Paul's wake disagreed with them, insisting that it was their message that had been given by God. In fact, as we'll see in a later chapter, Virtually everywhere Paul went, he had opponents who taught different understandings of the Christian message, all of whom naturally believed they were on the right side and Paul was on the wrong. What a pity for historians that the other sides of these stories have not been preserved. Ehrman and Aslan are right. There is a lot of tension in the New Testament between fellow teachers, Paul and Peter. So this would be the Acts, Acts 9, the mid-Acts position where where they're teaching different messages. So it's, it's uh, out, they're teaching different messages, and on top of that, they're in conflict with each other. So I don't know if I ever finished my story. So I was talking to a group of mid-Acts dispensationalists, and a lot of times, you know, Christians want to let their feelings dictate. There, there's uh, some people who use intuitions to dictate what they believe. And I said, no, well, Paul didn't agree with James. They, in fact, had a conflict. And, uh, and so someone objected, uh, some, some well-known guy, and he said, well, that would mean that uh, they, they didn't believe the same things. I said, yeah. So, <laughs> yes, that, that, is, that is in fact what it would mean. Um, 
you know, we don't we don't let uh, conclusions dictate the evidence. We don't let our conclusions drive what we believe. It could be the case, in fact, that Paul and James disagreed and had a heated, contentious arguments and frankly didn't like each other, we, right? We didn't like each other. We get hints of that within James. And Paul, and Paul, read Galatians. It's uh, just dripping with sarcasm. It's dripping with bitterness. It's dripping with anger. He is contending for the faith against fellow Christians, Christians that are stealing his converts. He doesn't like that. He has to fight against these fellow Christians. But anyways, you could be a dispensationalist without believing any of that. Uh, you could be an Acts 2 dispensationalist who believes that the dispensation changed in uh, Acts 2, and then it was uh, faith in Jesus and, and works or faith alone. At Acts 2, before Acts 2, Jesus' ministry was a separate thing, and then the change happened. In fact, one of the churches that I got kicked out of, I was kicked out of well, uh, partly for this reason, partly for being an Acts 9 dispensationalist rather than Acts 2. And then a different church I was kicked out of. I was just kicked out of two churches. A different church I was kicked out of was just for being a dispensationalist, saying that different people were preaching the same, quote-unquote, gospel in different ways or different gospels at the same time. You know, gospel is kind of a loose term. A lot of people want to make it a proper noun and make it about one specific thing. This one thing is the gospel. But gospel is a Greek word. It just means good news. So there's different flavors of good news. And if uh, Peter, if he's teaching the Jews to circumcise and follow the laws, if James is teaching that, and then Paul is teaching the Gentiles that they don't have to do these. They, the, uh, But both of them, both of them, for the sake of this uh, hypothetical, are teaching that all you need is faith in Jesus, in addition to whatever else they're given. Faith in Jesus that is the gospel. The good news is the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, who's going to lead an apocalyptic revolution, overthrowing of the current world over and an establishment of a government of God. That is the gospel. So I went on a lot of trains of thought and uh, it's kind of all over the place. But fundamentally, dispensationalism is the idea that God works differently with different groups of people in different time periods. It's not about, oh, it's theories about the rapture or theories about premillennialism or, uh, you know, uh, any of the any of these blood moons. There's that uh, Hagee guy. I went to that Hagee's church once and uh, it was an awful time. It was it was a big infomercial, the whole service. But he's well known for being like a quote unquote crazy dispensationalist who talks about blood moons. That's not all dispensationalists. It's, in fact, it's not me. I'm an amillennialist and I'm a dispensationalist. So when people try to tell me that dispensationalism means rapture theology, millennialism, I'm a dispensationalist and I'm a no rapture amillennialist. And so we can't be conflating that with dispensationalism. Dispensationalism needs to be boiled down to the idea that God deals differently with different people in different manners, at different points of time, in different places. God is relational. God deals with different people groups differently. God deals with different people differently. God could change the way he deals with people. God could change his rules. God could change how he deals with people. The methods for approaching God, for meeting God, for interacting with God. The standards for becoming righteous or being considered righteous. These things can change because God is dynamic. All right, we probably went long enough and everyone's probably uh, well confused. Just leave all your comments and questions. Uh, hate mail, I love hate mail. Just put that down below. Thank you for listening.